Hi, this is Scott Miller. Welcome to my top performance blog. I have the pleasure today of speaking with psychologist, Dr. Eric Gelfi. Hi, Eric. Hello, thank you for having me. It's really my pleasure. And I'm grateful that you would agree to speak with me about your research because it's a subject that I've heard many users of routine outcome measures bring up. And that is when the client's experience of progress doesn't match the measure. And in particular, when they might be saying, hey, I'm this is helping me, but the measure either says it's not helping them or actually they might be getting worse. And so I'm first sort of wondering, what's the story behind you deciding to explore this topic? Well, I think you're right. And even as a budding clinician before getting into this research, I had that same sense that the measure and the client didn't always align in their feelings about what was going on. And so one of my lab mates, I guess we can call him, he's a year ahead of me, he did a, a really small study looking at this phenomenon, just kind of a little probe. And he found that there was decent congruence for people that OQ categorized as improvers and even for non-treatment response, non-response. There was, there was, there were some gaps for sure. There was, there were incongruences, but for deteriorators, the gap was much larger. In fact, we found in the pilot study that 50% of the people at the OQ had pegged as deteriorators said that they had improved. Wow. Less, less than 10% said that they had deteriorated. And we thought that is interesting. Like that's important because one of the most the reason we use the OQ in many cases is to prevent deterioration. And it turned out that maybe this isn't even capturing treatment failure or det deterioration very well at all. Wow. So I just want to make sure I understand this. There was a fair bit of congruence or reasonable congruence when the measure said progress was being made. Yeah, there was reasonable congruence. Again, of course, there's some incongruence. But nothing that would be like alarming or shocking to I think to most clinicians be like that makes sense. A small percentage you know, disagreed or said they hadn't changed or gotten worse if we thought they'd improved. But when it comes to the OQ in this particular case, the outcome questionnaire forty five saying that somebody was getting worse, then the congruence jumped up significantly to fifty percent. Yeah, well, and and you could even say to ninety percent if we're considering then you know, clients would say, I didn't, you know, nothing changed in therapy or I got better. That was the case 90% of the time when we mm. thought something had deteriorated on the OQ. Okay, so the combination of, hey, actually I got better or nothing happened was approaching 90%. Mm -hmm. Wow, amongst this group that the OQ is saying, nah, things are actually getting worse. Correct. And so your lab mate sort of highlights some of this in a exploratory small study and you decide to follow it up what are, what kind of numbers are we talking about here eric so in the first day i believe it was around 50. okay and in mine we found we were just looking at deteriorators so we screened for them so i think the first study was like 50 overall and then in the next study we we had 106 i believe 106. just deteriorators so we were looking at that population specifically and of that total sample just so people who are listening in get a sense of what the base rates are. What are you finding both internationally is the percentage of people that are identified as deteriorators and in your sample? So it does vary widely between what kind of study we're looking at, but it ranges between five and 14% in the pub published literature of studies that actually report deterioration rates, which is unfortunately not a lot. Often deteriorators are lumped in with non-responders, even though I believe that there's reason to consider them distinct groups. But yeah, it, it tends to range between there. And our center, it's pretty frequently around 10% when we pull out those numbers. So right around 10%. And then you do some follow-up questionnaires and you talk with these folks and a significant percentage can't relate to what the OQ is saying is actually happening in care. Correct. Even and when, so in, in our, so my study, the primary study I'm talking about here was qualitative. We were interviewing deteriorators on the OQ who thought they had gotten better, trying to figure out what's, what's going on here. And we actually ended up telling them in the interview, hey, 
you said you got better in the OQ45, thought you got worse. <laughs> what do you make of that? You know? uh, so we tried to get their theories about it. And uh, there's a lot of fascinating responses. A lot of them were, I, I think what we'd expect, like, oh, I just bombed this test right before my last session, or you know, this, this stuff was going on with my family. So it was kind of extra therapeutic factors that were driving the OQ up, but that they that didn't reflect on their experience in therapy necessarily. Other, I think, fascinating information here relates to things like therapeutic orientation. There are a lot of ACT clinicians, for example, at BYU CAPS, and a lot of clients in this study would say, well, yeah, I might have been more distressed, but I felt like I could handle my distress much better than I could before. Like, it didn't mm. fix me nearly as much. So yeah, maybe my IQ score went up, but it didn't bother me all that much, and that was a big difference for me. Wow. So what these standard outcome tools, which simply measure distress, doesn't capture is the client's dealing with that distress in, in a different or a better way. So maybe the world around me doesn't change. Maybe even my internal state of distress doesn't change, but I have changed and that's just not captured. Correct. That kind of personal development doesn't seem to be captured, at least by the OQ45. This could be something I suppose that clinicians could tease out in the event that whatever outcome tool they're using begins to indicate that the client's deteriorating, but the client insists otherwise. I think so. I think it's just too complicated of a process for us to capture with any one measure. And so you mentioned extra therapeutic factors. You mentioned this interaction with orientation and that we really didn't capture the client's ability to deal with their distress. Were there other interesting findings that emerged? Yeah, I think one for me was considering the weight that a lot of these measurement tools have for clients. I think it's, it's easy for us as therapists who do this all the time to kind of understand, yeah, these are limited. But we had several times in the interviews, one time in particular stood out uh, when, when we told them, oh, you actually got worse, according to the OQ, but you said you got better. We had one person who was you know, throughout the interview, like talking very positively of therapy and their experience. And when we told them that, they said, you know, kind of deflated and, oh, I guess I, I guess I was wrong. I guess I actually am doing worse than I was before. And so I think it's really important to consider like the sort of pseudo objectivity that these measurement tools can hold. We, we print out these graphs. It looks very thorough and mathematical. And I think for a lot of students who don't have that background that we do it, or just a lot of clients who don't have that background, it can be disorienting and, and confusing. And I just want to make sure I've understood this 50% of the clients who were measurably worse off actually said that they were better? Correct. And then your data shows when you followed up and you interviewed folks that mentioning this or talking about it, at least ex post treatment, could have a distressing effect. It could make people re-examine. It could maybe raise the risk to these folks. Yeah, I think so. And not in every case. But yeah, there were a number of times that happened in the interview process when it was it was a little bit shocking. And I do want to actually correct something. So it was in the pilot study that it was 50%. Okay. And in, in my study, which had a larger sample size, it was 58%. So it was actually higher. Okay. I thought you were going to, honestly, I thought you were going to say it was much, much lower. <laughs> but that even puts the pressure on more to have a kind of conversation or facilitate a kind of conversation in the presence of a deteriorating OQ, or in my instance, the ORS score with the client that allows them to talk freely about their experience, not confirming that test score. Totally. So Eric, did you actually interview the folks that the OQ predicted correctly their experience of deterioration? We did not. It's a very small sample size. It took us a long time to even build up enough to get the population large enough to interview deteriorators who thought they'd gotten better. Okay. And it was about 9% of the deteriorators in our sample who agreed with the measure. And this is kind of the real shock here. And the clinical implications of that 
seem staggering. And that is, we should not be making treatment decisions. I'm putting words in your mouth here. So tell me if, if it, you're, you're the one who did the research. We should not be relying solely on any measure of, uh, of deterioration in terms of clinical decision making. Yeah, I don't think we should be relying solely on any on any measure for that. I think it's useful to know it's it could be a piece of data, but to take it with a big lump of salt and you maybe use it to direct maybe questions you might ask the, the client, but not. I, I think it's easy for us to conflate deterioration on the OQ or whatever measure we're using as treatment failure or as treatment going off course. But I think it's becoming very clear that that's to me at least that that's not the case. Perfect. At times, I wondered if clients who are actually on a measure like this getting worse that they themselves are filling out could be because the presence of a good connection with a helping professional. So could they be substituting progress, actual change in their distress level with the, the, the presence of a good relationship? I absolutely think so. Yeah. I mean, we have some, at least in my study, some data about that. Even to the, to the contrary, like there were cases where their OQ score got worse, according to the client, because they felt that they could be more forthright in the measure, that they could be just open and say whatever was really going on for them. They were practicing skills like assertiveness and interacting with the OQ more assertively, mm. saying things like, I'm just going to say what I really think now. And mm. that happens to be like, I'm feeling bad today. Hmm. Uh, whereas before they said they were much more conservative with the way they answered those questionnaires. So another implication certainly has to be that the therapist has to create a climate in the room where whatever the client says in the service of their particular goals or objectives is, is tolerated, allowed, and encouraged. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, I don't think I've ever done good therapy if I at least didn't attempt to create an environment where the client can feel that type of openness. And so what are the key skills or implications we take from this, Eric, moving forward? Yeah, to me, a big one is to use multiple means of assessing outcome. Mm. Like any one measure, I think, is very likely to fall short or even one type of measure. It's just too complicated again. I think the, the complexity of the process is at the heart of what. So this phenomenon of the incongruence. This wasn't coined when I started this research, but it was you know, when I was in the middle of my dissertation. It's been called paradoxical outcomes. When across different means of assessing outcome, one client has uh, given incongruent answers. And this is very common. Uh, it turns out it's, you know, it wasn't just in our center that people have been observing this. So it, I think one big takeaway for me is just like if I was doing a psychological assessment, I wouldn't just give somebody one measure and call it a day. I'm going to be more interested in you know, getting lots of different types of data and piecing it all together, you know, actually having to think about it rather than trust it all to, to something else. Are there other implications that immediately come to mind? Yeah, I think for, for me as a clinician, one thing that I've taken away is working to focus on the process more or at least as much as the outcome. I mean, that's the thing we can control. That's something I, I think as therapists, we help clients do all the time, whether they're performers or athletes or you know, whatever it might be is let's focus let's actually get a list of the things that you can control and focus on that and there are some measures like there's something called the c sets but it's the like client critical experiences in therapy i think it's, it's called a uh, scale that looks at client experiences in therapy it's based on qualitative research actually about what mm -hmm. clients find helpful in therapy and it turns that into a quantitative measure uh, assessing kind of your relationship with the client, how much acceptance they feel from you. And so I think using, using a measure like that, that assesses how well the process is going in addition to how the outcomes are looking from a distress mm -hmm. angle is, it's important to me. And that's what Utah Valley University, where I'm working now, that's what we do there. Mm -hmm. I found that just really helpful to have that data. It dovetails really nicely with the work we're doing on deliberate practice. If you mm -hmm. become overly outcome focused, you leave behind the how. Well, how are we supposed to be working together? And much of what you've said today convinces me that we really do need to be focusing more on the measurement or assessment or evaluation of, of the how along the way. Maybe the outcomes can 
give us a red light or, or say, keep going, but they really can't tell us how to drive the vehicle. I Perfect. really like that metaphor. Hmm. Eric, was there anything else that you wanted to add before we end here? Nothing coming to mind uh, right now. I mean, I think that covers most of it. I'm happy to answer any other questions you or your listeners might have and include my contact info. Perfect. So it's okay to do that along with the link to your research. Absolutely. Perfect. Thanks so much, Eric, for your time today. Of course, thank you for having me. I think she has problems, but I do too. I find myself...